when gay men reperform a certain form of hyper masculinity and they think that they're trying to explode it, most straight men look at that and are like, oh, you're desperate to be just like us. You know, like they don't actually think of it as like exploding gender binaries. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, straight men out there who do listen, you know, definitely reach out to Ramsey or I if you want to start doing this work with us. Straight men we'll might to, like, also want to have sex with men. Yeah. <laughs> and like, don't well, know, I mean, like, they might also want to have sex with men without necessarily being gay and they don't know how to articulate it. Like, I don't know. It could be any number of things. That's true. I've seen them on Grinder. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? If so, the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. Have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces, in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie, or what have you. In addition to the articles published in the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog as well as personal essays on its popular Here's My Story section. This allows people like you to share their own experiences with our readers. To learn more about submitting either to the print or the online edition of the GNLR, visit glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W dot org and scroll down to the bottom of the page to find a link to their writer's guidelines. If you have any questions, email stephen.hemrick at glreview.org. The GNLR can't wait to see what you have to say. And remember that they're offering an exclusive code with the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. So when you subscribe to the magazine, you'll receive a free copy with any print or digital subscription. So that's seven issues instead of six. Again, just visit the glreview.org and click subscribe and enter the promo code ITBR for your free issue. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I'm really excited to have this guest on because not only does he know one of my mentors and dissertation committee members, which you all here don't always get to hear about my personal academic di dissertation experience, um, but I'm so excited to be joined with someone who I think is really cutting edge in queer theory right now. I want to discuss how he's reaching out to the broader public because he is, and just that whole academic to the broader audience, which is so in the topic and the news with humanities and what do we do in the university. So before I bury the headline, I'm joined with uh, Ramsey Fawaz, who just wrote a book called Queer Forms, which I'm holding up for all of you who are watching the video. It's so beautiful. Um, so welcome first, Ramsey, before I just start spitballing. Yeah, thanks and for having me. It's such a delight. Questions. I'm so glad to meet you. And I love all of the kind of intellectual connections we have, especially with your mentor. Yeah, so Victoria Hesford, shout out to Victoria Hesford at Stony Brook University, um, is on my dissertation committee. And she was the um, first experience I had with feminist theory for my grad certificate. So I have a... I'm getting my PhD in English in a few months, um, and I have a grad certificate in women's gender sexuality studies. So you were speaking my language right away right yeah. in your book. And congrats so like, that you're so close. That's amazing. It's like a beautiful yeah. moment and a milestone. Yeah, it's full of a lot of what you can relate to. Sure. Um, the excitement of finishing the project, but also being glad that I have such a large network both in and outside the university, because yeah. right now um, I'm realizing the importance of having a digital media voice in a yeah. queer space. So like yeah. maybe to start there with, you know, the state of affairs in academia, yeah. like with your book, I'm noticing there's such this important popular culture fixation on say, um, Tales of the City or 
you begin your intro with Thelma and Louise and this yeah. ripping moment of their suicidal slash freedom, lesbian, queer journey that they're going to go on that we're just left on the edge of our seats. Yeah. Like, why was that so important just to foreground in what you do with your research of let's turn to the pop? Yeah. So yeah. just a little background around me, you know, I have a PhD in American studies from George Washington University. And at UC Berkeley, where I did my undergraduate work, I double majored in English and American studies. And throughout that whole period of at both schools, I was trained by popular culture studies scholars. So people who took really seriously the idea that popular media is not merely a reflection of existing historical realities. It's not like history happens, meaningful events happen, famous people, celebrities, um, uh, political figures, presidents, like make history and then media makers reflect that history. Like these scholars were against that model. So I became really, really interested in that idea of popular culture being one of the places that we imaginatively like work through big political problems in our society. Um, so that's a lot of the reason I centralized popular culture um, is that it's one of the forms of media that is most accessed by people en masse, right? Like way more people watch movies and read literature than read theory or scholarship. So I, I want to be able to understand how popular culture kind of conveys extremely complex, rich, supple ideas that scholarship then can be in dialogue with. Like, I'm not interested in using scholarship just to illuminate popular culture, like to tell you, like, here's the actual meaning, right? Like, that isn't my point. My point is to say, like, how can scholarly ideas um, kind of be in a conversation with popular culture? Like, what if we treated popular culture as its own kind of theorizing, like its own kind of scholarship, right? And we were we were in dialogue across our different modalities. That's kind of what's important to me. Yeah, so with that importance you've laid out of using pop culture as a lens through which to understand whether it be queer feminist. I mean, you're doing what's exciting, this queer feminist intersection mm -hmm. um, in your research. But right away, you start off your book with, I think, this tension that really does exist between queer theory, quote unquote, yeah. in academia and activist circles, but also those who are not in the university reading the jargon, yeah. feeling that there's those who are beholden, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong with your analysis, but it really seems that there's these, the tension between whether we're going to fixate on identity, yeah. like fixate on categories, um, gay, lesbian, straight, yeah. you know, delay it all out th for the audience here. Queer even, which um, some activists are for the fluidity you say of sexuality yeah. and some are really don't think the fluidity is helpful. So like why, um, why is it so important to recognize the tensions and not just, you know, as a queer theorist, which I consider yourself to be a queer theorist, um, to just say, okay, I'm just gonna do the, look all into fluidity and just be non-normative yeah. and don't worry about actual essential categories. Yeah, I mean, I think that first of all, there's always been a feedback loop between mm -hmm. feminist and queer activism on the ground, like actual political movements to transform social, cultural, political conceptions of what gender and sexuality can be and the theoretical intellectual work of developing concepts to explain gender and sexual nonconformity. Like, like activism and scholarship are in a dialogue. They're like always relating to one another. AIDS activism was its own kind of theorizing on the ground, but it also inspired a variety of scholars, right, to produce some of the most important ideas in the history of queer theory like Paula Treichler's epidemic of signification, you know, Douglas Crimp thinking about promiscuity as like a form of radical 
uh, theorizing about sexual diversity, like all of those ideas come out of AIDS activism and then feed back into activism. So there's always been a relationship between those two. They're not opposed, right? Whatever we call the jargon of intellectual life also provides fuel. It gives people ideas that they can take up. Part of what I wanted to do in this book was I wanted to kind of shift the frame within which contemporary queer theorizing and activism thinks about identity. We tend to have a, a view today that there is an opposition or there has always been an opposition between essential categories, like you were saying, like the idea that we're gonna name ourselves gay or lesbian or women, et cetera, and the fear that those categories are limiting and fixed and constraining and the alternative which is um, anti-identitarianism, the idea of fluidity, of flexibility, of being open-ended. I think the problem is, is that those two things are not in opposition. They are within a, the same frame, which is the frame of self-making. Both of them are obsessed with the idea of identity as a practice of making a self. So even though they seem like a binary opposition, like a fixed self, and a fluid self, they're both about selves, right? Now, none of us could have like could function in the world without having some coherent sense of being a person, right? Of having personhood. The problem is, is that when all politics are always articulated in the frame of self-making, it completely negates the reality that politics is about communing with others. It is about reaching out beyond a self it's often about being destabilized fundamentally in your perception of your personhood. When you encounter other perspectives in a wider world, what happens to you? You are shaken out of your, your perception of who you are and you are transformed in relationship to other people. Part of what I wanted to do in this book is to say that contemporary queer and feminist politics have become trapped within the frame of identity. I'm not trying to just critique identity politics, which a million people have done, right? Identity politics, as I talk about in the book, you know, Rostam Mesley, this brilliant scholar points out, he's like, identity politics is just a description of a politics of location. Like I come from a specific place. I grew up in a specific place. I see the world from a specific vantage point and that vantage matters. Who could disagree with that? I'm 100% for that. What I'm against is the idea that the self must always be the location from which every form of political um, community is produced. The notion of fluidity within gender, uh, like gender and sexual non-conforming communities, my problem with it is not the spirit of the claim. Like, of course, I love the idea that gender and sexuality are open-ended and changing. The thing is, is that fluidity is an existential description of what it means to live in the world. It's practically Buddhist, right? Like we literally are fluid. Like time is always moving forward. People and bodies are always changing. You're never the same from one moment to another. You cannot make an existential fact of life into a value. Mm -hmm. It cannot be an aspirational ideal. It's just a fact. It's literally how things are. So for me, I think that when you set up fluidity as an aspirational ideal, what I say in the book, it becomes an impossible standard to try to live up to, to, to have a gender or sexual identity that is constantly in flux, always changing, always fluid, always open-ended. It's impossible and it's exhausting. And it's not really a description of how everyday life is lived. Even if the world is fluid, we don't always experience it that way in our everyday life. And if we did, we would basically deliquesce, right? We would like we would like liquefy into the ether. We we or or we would become mentally ill. Like we, like the the inability to keep a coherent sense of self ever is a problem. And so part of what I try to say, and and I follow people like we've talked a lot about the scholar Linda Zarilli, who's always invested in making feminism and queer theory or queer politics as well, kind of question the frames within which they operate. I kind of question the identity focused frame altogether and the, the binary of fixity and fluidity. I'm like, could we get out of the binary where we yo-yo back and forth mm -hmm. from having rigid gender and sexual identities to having fluid identities? Like both of them are problematic. How do we get out of it? Yeah. Thank you. 
Hi, this is Andrew, and I'm interrupting what I know is an enthralling interview because I want you all to know that we are sponsored by Broadview Press. And if you don't know, Broadview Press is an independent academic publisher who publishes books covering topics like English studies, writing, philosophy, history, gender studies. And every season on the podcast, I interview one of the Broadview Press authors. So for the fall, we had Ann Stevens on to talk about literary theory and criticism. She played a Wizard of Oz literary game with us. She talked about why Bridgerton actually involves literary theory. So does Fifty Shades of Grey. Who knew? Um, and also, we just had on Jeffrey Weinstock, who wrote the first ever pop culture analysis book. So, you know, I am all things a lover of pop culture, especially my Hollywood topics, Real Housewives, the list goes on and on. And he also wrote the book called The Mad Scientist's Guide to Composition, where he's writing a book teaching students about how to write rhetorical strategies, but it's all around this metaphor of being in the mad scientist laboratory, because as you'll learn when you hear our episode with Jeffrey, he is a gothic and horror fanatic. And I mean that in all the best ways possible. So you don't want to miss Broadview Press's exclusive discount because you're listening to the podcast. All of you get an automatic 20% off Use the code Ivory Tower for 20% off site wide on all of their books. So, our, in our show notes, we have a link to Broadview Press. Make sure you click the link, put in Ivory Tower, and you're going to get 20% off your order. So, enjoy your reading, everyone. So, this Countering the binary, I love how you're putting it, of fixed identities and the fluidity. It really reminds me of you right away open with the 1970s. And mm -hmm. here on the podcast, I had Michaela Grifo on, and the episode has been out. So anyone out there, listen to it. But she actually was part of the Gay Liberation Front in 1969. Mm. She started Radical Lesbians. Wow, um, yeah. In New York City. All yes. of which I talk yeah. about in the book. So yeah, that's- You talk about all of that history. But I think it was so important when she came on because um, she said that there's a lot of backlash that she gets in her current, in the current moment because she questions, like, where have the lesbians gone? Or, yeah. you know, when I was on there, I said, you know, there's still a large gay male space or, yeah. you know, bi male space. Men has, having sex with yeah. men, I'll put it that way, um, on Fire Island, because I, you know, will go a lot during the summer since I live so close. Yeah. And I think, though, like you're saying, it doesn't have to either be um, one or the other. It doesn't have to be that you can't enjoy, you know, I can't enjoy my gayness and my journey of coming out and being with other, you know, queer yeah. men. But you also can recognize there's a fluidity, but I, there does the tension. Well, uh, just if I might there. intervene, an alternative no, go ahead, go is ahead. to say that we can recognize that we inhabit particular identities provisionally mm -hmm. for certain periods of time. Um, this is Lucas Crawford's idea, right? Like, what if you what if you saw identity as a short term lease? You know, he's like, what if you inhabit different identities briefly for certain periods of time and they're meaningful to you? or you inhabit them in specific spaces. Like you go to a space like Fire Island and you're like, I'm around gay men and I identify right now as a gay man, whatever that might mean, right? Um, certain sexual practices, certain uh, innuendos, certain ways of talking, whatever, which are all themselves provisional. Mm -hmm. And then being able to develop the skills to recognize those identities as provisional, open-ended, open to change, and being able to pivot Right, being able to cognitively shift frames so that you can go in and out of an identity thoughtfully in a measured way, right? You and I have talked about briefly online about the idea that I call the shape shifting, right? Mm -hmm. Like a, a slow and steady or measured and meaningful change across time. I think that 
um, again, like we trap ourselves in the idea that identities are either rigid and bounded or they're endlessly fluid. And I'm like, I don't think they're either. I think that they can take different shapes at different times. Um, and they have to have a certain amount, identities need to have a certain amount of coherence to make sense and to be translated to other people. That doesn't mean that they are not flexible, subject to change and even um, abandonment. The idea that some identities become old, like they, they, they kind of like don't fit anymore and people kind of rethink them or reimagine them or reinvent them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have more to say about that, but that's- No, no, but, and I think that, you know, taking Vicky's book, Feeling Women's Liberation, it also reminds me um, of the consciousness raising groups. You start off with this quote about um, women's consciousness raising yeah. groups and how there's very different takeaways. Like one found that being in the consciousness raising group that she could embrace aspects of femininity that were quote unquote, not the beauty standard or not the sure. 1970s, like emanating from the 60s to 50s housewife. And I I think it's so fascinating what you're saying, Ramsey, because um, in the 70s too, we have the golden age of porn, right? Yeah, With gay sure. porn. And I was just hearing this podcast called Demystifying Gay Porn. Love them. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and they were talking about the centurions, centurions of Rome, I think is the film. Mm. But um, that there's such an explosion of different culture in that moment, even though on the outside of the surface, um, in quote unquote, say straight spaces or what we would say in academia, heteronormative spaces, they'd have no idea that all of this um, influx of feminist and queer discussions and representation is happening on ma sure. in mass. So I think like, it's interesting to discuss what's happening publicly on the outside of yeah. culture and what's happening in more of what we'll say niche LGBTQ type spaces. And, and I think this is actually yeah. goes back to your first question that you asked me. This is part of the reason I love popular culture and studying it, because I think one of the many things that popular culture does is it translates ideas that might circulate or exist among very specific groups of people like gay liberationists or radical feminists or whatever, right? Or black lesbian feminists. And it takes, like popular culture will take some of those ideas and it will magnify them and it will make them accessible to a wide audience. So like one of the kind of key case studies of my book that I talk about a lot is the famous gay Hollywood film, The Boys in the Band, right? Based on a wildly successful Broadway, off-off-Broadway off play, uh, of the same title. Um, the movie comes out in 1970. It's about a group of gay men who s sit in a circle at one of their houses to celebrate a birthday party and they end up screaming at each other the whole night. They, they had a terrible fight and they scream at each other. And what's astonishing is that that movie is made in 1970. It's a Hollywood production, um, but it has all out gay men and it models the feminist idea that you just mentioned of consciousness raising, the idea of women sitting in a circle and debating their experiences of sexism. But it translates that to a mass audience through the figure of the gay male friendship circle. Whether you're gay or feminist or not or whatever, it doesn't matter because most people have a circle of friends, regardless of your gender or sexuality. So you can understand the idea of a group of friends sitting together arguing about their different perspectives on something. Yeah. So part of the brilliance of the movie is it translated an idea that was circulating, a political form that was circulating among radical feminist and um, kind of queer groups. And it, and it introduced it to wide audiences without beating them over the head about feminist and queer politics, right? I mean, that's part of the genius of that movie. Um, and like you said, right, uh, about the idea that consciousness raising produced all these different effects, the radical feminist activist Ann Snitto has, which who I quote, like it's one of my epigraphs of my book. She reflects back on the period of the seventies. She talks to a friend and she's like, what was it like for you to be in those consciousness raising groups? Like with other women. And her friend is like, oh my God, I finally felt like I could be proud to be a woman. Right. And Ann Snitto laughs and is like, oh my God, I felt the complete opposite which is I finally was like, I don't have to be a woman anymore, right? And part of her point is to say that feminist politics at its best allows for all of those options. 
It's not about being able to have a fixed identity or to be endlessly fluid. It's to be able to choose among a vast range of different options. If you want to call yourself a woman, do it. If you don't, don't, right? Like it's about opening up the playing field. And that is another way of saying that feminism was about shifting the frame of reference with within which all people of all genders, it focused right on gender and sexually marginalized people, these movements did, but they really were about everyone because at some level, everybody is constrained by gender and gender norms. Um, and I think that opening out of imaginative possibility is, is really at the core of what feminist and queer politics is about, not about deciding one way or another that one should have a fixed identity or one should always be fluid. Like, th like two, that's it? How fluid could that be? You know, like I, th that's that's part of my issue, right? Is it's like to reduce the, the, the political project of queer and feminist thought to, to that, that binaristic idea. You get, you get an identity or you get to be fluid. It just doesn't make sense. That's not really what to me it's about. So, you know, to transition, I'm holding yeah. a 64 ounce bottle of water, which is <laughs> massive and I'm thirsty, but I'm really thirsty to talk about a lot of discussions here, which is sex in the media, but specifically with your work, you bring together so much conversations around sex in terms yeah. of like, not necessarily pornographic, but in yeah. terms of representation throughout the 70s yeah. into the current moment with all your different yeah. um, pop culture examples. And I do wonder, you know, there's so many queer theorists, especially um, Tim Dean, who's going to come on the podcast soon. Oh, and, yeah. Yep. But there's been a lot Lauren Berlant wrote about. So, you know, in addition, Damon Young, you know, along with Lauren Berlant and Tim Dean uh, is a brilliant film scholar who's written this amazing book called Making Sex Public. That's also about the moment that French and American cinema became obsessed with representing sex on screen in the 1960s and 70s. Yeah. So why do you believe the claim that queer theorists right now are afraid to touch sex? Like they're afraid to be explicit in their um, work? I do and I don't. I do and I don't. I love Tim, Tim Dean's work. I think he's brilliant. I think Unlimited Intimacy was like a major game change for me in terms of the way I think. Um, I think part of my frustration with Dean's criticism of the field is that it, he's he doesn't acknowledge enough, at least from what I've read, that for a lot of young queer study scholars living in this environment around like questions of sexual consent, questions of boundaries, you know, if you're a graduate student to go study actual sex cultures and to participate in them potentially could be very dangerous to you, right? Like you could get in trouble. You could have students that turn on you, you know, in the academic job market, people are getting a lot of jobs at smaller universities in conservative parts of the country. I think it would be very difficult to be a young queer theorist who's like, I'm going to talk about my own sex practices, right? Like Tim Dean, as a very established scholar in Unlimited Intimacy, is able to talk about himself having bareback sex, right? Like that's unbelievable. Like it works really well in the context of that book. That is a very risky thing, right? And I'm not talking about sexual risk. I'm talking about professionally risky yeah. and it pays off for him. Because, well, don't worry. I'm going to ask him about this. So. Right? Like, it pays <laughs> off for him because the book is so brilliantly done and, and he is he's able to bring kind of autoethnography, right? Like, writing about his own experiences into it. I don't think most people know how to do that. I don't think most people, or have, like, that's something you achieve, right? Like, I started talking about my own life experiences much more explicitly in queer forms. That mm -hmm. was an achievement for me intellectually, like, to speak autobiographically. You know, I didn't even talk about my own comic book reading experiences in The New Mutants, right? Which I could have easily done because um, I'd grown up reading comics. So I think I, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement of that. Um, uh, but I do agree with him that by and large, the field did move away from sexual practice to talking about sex as an ideological formation. Um, and I do think that that is a problem 
um, because not because queer theory should be about sex, but because sex does matter. Um, and that sex is a form of important intimacy between human beings. The fact that 70 years out from the Kinsey reports, like American culture still has so little data about like the sex practices of Americans, the way we have, the fact that we have no instituted sex education in this country. I'm teaching class on AIDS activism. My students are mind boggled that there is no sex education. Right. Like, I do think that queer studies could play a role in educating people about the diversity of sex. Right. And the way that it happens and the way it's done. But but I would also say in the wake of his book, a lot of people have been inspired to write mm -hmm. about sex. There's an entire book by Ricky Varghese, brilliant, brilliant psycho queer psychoanalyst. And um, it's written with somebody else. I'm forgetting the co-editor. They did an entire book about prep and the culture, the new cultures of gay sex. Right, uh, an edited volume that Tim Dean, I think, wrote the intro, like like the preface to. So I, I don't think the claim is fully true, but I do think it's an important provocation. Like I I take very seriously the things that Tim Dean says. Yeah, well, don't worry, Tim Dean. Yeah, Ramsey has prepped the way for your interview. Yeah, yeah for exactly. Our talking points, but even like how I've opened up here in the podcast, whether it be especially about like my openness around sex in the media and even when I went to Fire Island like analyzing my own auto theory like I love how you called it yeah, yeah. auto ethnography but your um memoirist style because yeah it is important in my opinion to take those chances but sure. not everyone who's a writer or an academic or an author sometimes they want that distance and I respect that but for me I feel that my experience is whether it even be my thirsty gym bro photos. Sure. I've coined gay gym bro. So anyone yeah, who tries sure. to take that, they owe me money. But yeah. um, that it's an aspect of then when I write down and talk about homoerotic poetics, like all of that to yeah. me is part of it. But you're right. It's you also put yourself out there like this podcast puts me out there as a public Absolutely. person. And, you know, I'm going to get all different responses. And I also know that a type of position who wants me, they're, they're going to need to accept all of who I am and how open I am. So, well, and I want to add yeah. another dimension as a scholar, right? Like I'm going to yeah. sound now really conservative, right? We're, we've gone from one extreme to another in the humanities, as far as I can tell, at least in the literary and cultural studies humanities, we went from a model that was often highly theoretical right? Like mm -hmm. the absorption of French and, and continental critical theory in the 70s and 80s, where like by the 90s, you get these extremely abstracted analyses of culture, the stuff that I grew up on, right? Like people doing these ideological reads of like, like the classic, the joke is always like, of like Madonna music videos, right? And, and these were drop dead elegant to borrow Eve Sedgwick's phrase, right? Like analyses of culture that were often divorced from like everyday life. Yes, I think that we've gone the opposite extreme, which is now everybody seems to want to, I, I'm, at, I'm making massive generalizations, right? This isn't true of actually everyone, but like people seem to want to just do auto theory. Like if people just want to write memoir, basically, people were inspired by brilliant work like that of Sadia Hartman and Paul B. Preciado among, and Lauren Berlant's work, right? But the thing is, is like most scholars are not that good yet about theorizing out of their own experience. Like it takes time to master that. It's also a form of creative nonfiction. It's yes. like, so sometimes I look at a lot of young scholars and I'm like, do you research anything? Like, do you go, and I'm not, I'm not trying to like fetishize the archive or something. I mean, like part of research is going and finding out something that other people don't know about the world, about some phenomenon. And I think um, if 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 we only move in the direction of talking about our own stories, we're doing something other than scholarship. Like that's a, di that's a different modality and nothing wrong with that, right? But I think that the, the ability to fuse the everyday life with scholarly work is extremely powerful because those two modalities inform one another. It makes scholarship more alive to lived experience. That is why Tim Dean's book is so fascinating because mm -hmm. he is also speaking out of his lived experience. And you're like, oh, like Gail, when Gail, like the precursor to Tim Dean, right, is Gail Rubin writing from the catacombs 
talking about, she doesn't talk so much about her own personal sex life, but she is talking about her investment in BDSM sex cultures. That's so inspiring, but also deeply scholarly. And I do think there has to be a balance of the two approaches if what you want to do is scholarship. Hi, this is Andrew. So, you know, when I'm not here in the Ivory Tower boiler room, sometimes I'm actually invited to be on other podcasts as a guest. Well, there is one podcast run by Christian Garcia and um, his co-host, Nate, that I absolutely love. It is called That Old Gay Classic Cinema. So calling all you classic cinema fans out there and those who love queer theme cinema, which I think there's a lot of you who are listening right now where you've uh, perked up. So follow them on Instagram at that old, O-L, gay classic cinema. The first ever episode I was featured as a guest, it's The Sound of Music. I got to talk about being Captain Von Trapp in high school, and it's just such an exciting conversation. They've also featured discussions about Gone with the Wind, The Wizard of Oz, which features guests from uh, the podcast The Garland Gab and Down the Yellow Brick Pod. There is a deep dive of Cinderella, and recently they had an episode on the film Giant starring Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson, and James Dean. And actually one of the uh, guests, Lauren Randall, I know from Stony Brook University's PhD English department. So shout out, Lauren. Um, you can listen to That Old Gay Classic Cinema on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. It's definitely such a great listen. So why not listen to it after you listen to this current episode on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room? Right. And like, yeah. Anyway, I well, mean, that sounds really good. No, no, you're right. Ways, but no, but I also feel that, um, right, in the background looming of all of this is job security, how already fighting for such small um, openings for if you want to go into a university and be yeah. on faculty, um, like how you position yourself. But I've also thought, okay, who are the, there are independent scholars who are in media spaces, like they're in all different Absolutely. areas. But I think sometimes um, there's a divorce between academia and those in, um, I don't know, TV, film, radio. Uh, well, and think all about it. Different yeah. Spaces. Your generation of scholars, you guys have been raised up on social media. So a lot of you guys have intelligently since grad school or earlier began to develop an, a profile in all of these online spaces. I was like the last generation that was trained in a classically scholarly way, but in a very, very contemporary updated mode. So I struggle at this stage of my career. It's like I've written two books. I'm a full professor. I've written a ton of articles. I did what I was supposed to do in my field. Like I landed these articles in the most prestigious journals in my field. And all of a sudden, when I'm doing a book tour around queer forums, I'm like, am I supposed to be trying to be famous? Like all of a sudden, I'm like, should I have been trying to like craft an online media personality so that I could have like, right? Like that wasn't what I was trained to do. Right. I was trained to believe that like you became you had notoriety in academia because one of your books hit the zeitgeist in a way that was like really, really important. Except now I've arrived at a place where people don't read books. Right. So it's like, <laughs> how do you like how do you navigate that? So I know a lot of us are trying to figure out like, mm -hmm. how do we speak to a broader audience without letting go the training that we had? Right. Like, yeah. I still believe in the value of the scholarly book. I think that we should resist the idea that people don't read scholarly books. Like now academic books are becoming like 120 pages, which to me is like a pamphlet. Like mm -hmm. I'm like, there has to be a story arc, right? There has to be like a, like a, like an entire, like I love good long books and people don't read that anymore. Yeah. So it's like. Well, and it, sorry. And I was just going to say, it's also, in my opinion, shout out to Broadview press. They're one of our sponsors here. Yeah. Um, and what they've done that I think is going in a really exciting direction is like they've partnered with say podcasts. Yeah. Mine is an example, but I bring on those authors. The Gay and Lesbian Review is involved with the Ivory Tower Boiler yeah. Room. And with these academic books, my constant um, searching is, oh, where's the audiobook? 
And like, I've noticed there's a yeah. space that hasn't been tapped because I'm yeah. such an audiobook and a, you know, sure. physical book reader. But, you yeah. know, when you're writing, sometimes my eyes are trained to listen to something, but then only read what I'm researching in that moment because it can sure. really take me away. But um, yeah, I'm hoping that academic presses, because yeah, I do I've think there's asked. a large... Yeah, and I would love queer forms to be an audiobook. So. Totally. I mean, I would be thrilled. Yeah. If that would if that oh, yeah. would also get people to access it more, I would be thrilled to do that. Yeah. Um, so NYU Press. That's a call for an appeal alas. for Ramsey's book to be an audiobook. <laughs> yeah. But, um because it is happening. I'm starting to see some academics traverse well, we talked about it, the podcast yeah. space, which is I think really key for how people are now tuning into theory is it's a yeah. lot of it's happening actually in podcast spaces That's, that makes sense yeah because that totally makes sense. yeah because our day-to-day -day lives now are so i think especially from the pandemic we're all balancing um projects that are coming from all sure. different directions and yeah but you're right to have that like three hour time block where i'm just sitting with a book i don't even i read your book actually in a bubble bath <laughs> Yeah, but like, it's funny you say that because that's actually my life, right? Like that's literally, uh, people tell me all the time, they're like, you read so much and you're so like polyglot. And I'm like, I literally sit every morning for three to four hours and all I do is read, right? And then I do lots of other things, right? I prepare to teach, I write, I start like looking up things. I don't write every day. I'm not somebody who writes every day. I write every once in a while in large chunks, but I mean, reading is a huge part of my life. And I also don't retain information by listening to audiobooks, right? I think again, it's a generational shift, but it's also um, temperamental. I know many people in my generation who once they discovered audiobooks were like, oh my God, I learned really well this way. I don't, right? Like I love sitting and reading and rereading and rereading. So I think, I, but I agree with you that having all of these ideas accessible in lots of different formats is really, really great. Um, but I also, I don't want people to view scholarship as somehow opposed to accessibility. Yes. Like scholarship is a mode of thinking at a very high level of complexity and precision. And if there's a word that I never want to fucking hear again, excuse my language. No, say, you can curse here. Every yes, time I jargon. see a popular review of an academic book, even when people love it, they're like, oh, it's an amazing, Publishers Weekly would be like, it's an amazing book. And there always has to be an obligatory sentence at the end, but there's a lot of jargon. It's an academic fucking book. Like it is going to have the language that is specific to the disciplinary field that that person wrote in. Corporate speak and corporate language is jargon. Yeah. Nobody comments on it, right? Like as something unique. It is the language of a particular arena. The language of nonprofits has jargon. For some reason, the language of academics is, is singled out as somehow inaccessible, not understandable, it is always possible to bridge the distance between ordinary audiences and academic language. You see in my book, I'm always explaining my terms. I'm like, when I use yeah. the word queer, this is what I mean. When I use the word shape-shifting, this is what I mean, right? Yeah. And You I don't just like, throw out a French term and then, exactly. like in the 1980s, there would be, sure. you know, Judith Butler will throw out terms, but it wasn't, you were expected to know the language. Exactly, so. because Judith Butler at the time was not aiming to be a public intellectual. She is mm -hmm. now, she's the now most she recognized is. public intellectual in the world, right? Um, but, I, and Lauren Berlatt was like the close second in some ways in the United States. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, we can't write that same way today and people don't. But I think for me, I want audiences to meet me halfway. I want yeah. them to recognize that I also speak a certain kind of language that has utility. The language of queer theory and of feminist theory has use. It, it explains the world in really complex, interesting ways. And I think um, trying to dismiss academic language out of hand is deeply anti-intellectual, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I agree. And I also think that um, like bringing up such, there's been so many queer theorists we've brought up. And our, my audience here, what I love is they're fellow LGBTQ academics, but there's artists, there's actors, there's, yeah. um, you know, general lovers of wanting to add books to their must yeah. read list. And it branches this public humanities audience, which I'm so 
you know, I know is my mission, but like you yeah. said, um, I think that we need to have academic inquiries. Um, I'm curious about, especially in your work, what I'm so fascinated with. I mean, I'll let everyone here know I'm using your work in my own chapter on homoerotic queering uh, Whitman's procreation method and model. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even when I use terms like homoeroticism, I'm starting to go into all these nuances. Like it's not just, you know, one universal representation. And I think it's important to draw the line of what's an autoerotic homoeroticism? What's mm -hmm. procreative homoeroticism? Sure. But like in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, wow, I didn't know there were all these valences. Sure. Uh, but right, that's the job of my job. That's what a scholar is supposed to do is yeah. create their own language around established terms. Shifting and, your frame yes. of reference, right? Like, I mean, part of what scholars do is they also impart like information, right? Like somebody goes to try to make a movie like The Woman King, right? Mm. Or the Emmett Till movie. And they actually need to turn to books that are like, here is the history based on research that we did, right? Like, how do you know how to construct a story about any historical event Right, the civil rights movement, women's and gay liberation. If you if you don't have like actual source material where people are like, we did all this heavy lifting to reconstruct the history for you. There's that. But yes. what people who do cultural and critical theory do is they go beyond that. They shift the frame within which you un even understand a set of ideas. So it's like you're seeing the world one way and a cultural theorist comes around and is like, actually, you could put this in a completely different frame, right? Like. So uh, just to give an example, in my AIDS cultural theory class yesterday, we were talking about the difference between a rights-based political project, the idea that marginalized groups turn to the state and they say, you have fucked us. Mm. We want redress. And uh, there's many names for that, right? Whether it's reparations or rights or like changing of the law or whatever. We want the state to recognize that we've been marginalized and to do something in a legal manner structurally to include us in a way that we haven't been included before, right? And then we talked about how an alternative to that, my students cannot imagine an alternative to that. That's all they can imagine. Then we read a bunch of thinkers who are like, but if the state is the thing that screwed you, why would you turn to the state to solve all your problems when it was the source of so many problems? Would there be a way to both undermine the state while also getting something from it, from, an, from another vantage point, right? So we talked about the idea of calling this, following Zerilli, a freedom-centered frame. What would be the freedom that you're seeking, not a right given to you by the government, but the freedom to commune in co like to act in concert with people who are not like you to change the conditions of your existence. If you started not from the demand for individual rights, I want my right to get married. I want my right to do whatever, but you started, I want the freedom to be co in, in concert with others. I want to act together and within that acting i will also make available gay marriage or this or whatever this would be a freedom centered frame and it would center not the acquisition of rights but the creation of spaces of freedom of like collective action my students were like their head exploded this is actually such a basic idea in democratic theory. People talk about this all the time. This goes back to Hannah Arendt's work. Then you see it in Linda Zerilli's work. You see it in Martha Nussbaum's work. Like you see it in all these different people's work, right? That doesn't mean that rights are meaningless or that, that people shouldn't seek them out, but we should recognize that they're constructed by groups of people in different periods of time. So the work of my class was to shift the frame within which my students could think about what politics is about, suddenly they're like, politics could be about something other than asking for rights. And that changes everything for them. That is the fundamental utility of any theory, especially queer and feminist theory, which shifts the frameworks within which we can even understand what gender and sexuality could be or become, right? That's the power. And I don't want that to be lost. Like, I don't think we should stop doing that work. Yeah, well, and you led us right there, which is Ramsey has such a nuanced way of presenting this gender sexual outlaw frame. 
Yeah. And like, what does it mean to be an outlaw in yeah. that concept? And it does remind me of why I fell in love with Linda Zarelli's. Remind me again, the book. This is the book called uh, Feminism and the Abyss of Freedom. Thank which you. Which is a, yeah. a work of genius and yeah. is really about reclaiming what she calls the world making capacity of feminism. Like in a nutshell, in like th three sentences, the book basically says feminism became obsessed with the social question, the idea of like, how do we do feminism to improve the lot of women? And in mm -hmm. the process of doing that, it forgot that feminism is really a world-making imaginative project of trying to project gender into completely new contexts for thought so that all people, men, women, trans people, gender non-conforming people could, comp could like develop forms of freedom like separate from gender hierarchy. And the book is an attempt to reclaim that freedom-centered focus of feminism. Yeah, and what I love is she really relies on philosophical concepts of temporality and uh -huh. that it really is to me this feminist philosophical political book about how do movements happen like we think that everything um and this is because vicky hesford sure you know provided yeah, yeah, yeah. all of these angles when i was sure. learning from vicky about the book that it's so interesting to think of um, the Stonewall Revolution. It gets built in our mind about how important it was because of how historical time works sure. in terms of remembering and saying, okay, that was people saying that's the, um, you know, fuel that began the LGBTQ rights movement, right? You have to start, it, yeah. it, it carries this type of um, publicity around it in a way uh -huh. of, a narrative. So I found that she really just understands, like you're saying, that freedom isn't, it, it doesn't have to just be tied to um, a large mass movement, like thinking of, okay, it can only be a moment like the Stonewall Revolution or, you know, like Gloria Steinem speaking during mm -hmm. uh, the second wave feminist movement, that there's all these pockets of what it means to have freedom, whether it even be that you're in a bar and you're feeling, um, except you're feeling that there's no pressure around hiding your identity, like however you yeah. construct freedom in your let life. Me, so let me put yeah, it this ahead. way. I mean, for Zerilli, she's like, the radical potential of a social movement like feminism does not lie in what it helps you know about the world. Like we look back and we're like, feminism let us know that gender is socially constructed. So now we're gonna be free. And she's like, most of us know that gender is socially constructed. We don't do anything about it. We still exist in gender dimorphic scripts. Like tons of people, all of us know that like gender is shaped by all these cultural phenomena and we still present as male or female. Like many of us, right? She's like, knowing is not the same as doing something about what you know. And she's like, what was amazing about radical feminism in the 70s and after its different iterations was not what it quote unquote revealed about gender, though that was also important. It was about the fact that women and other gender outlaws began to act in new ways. It was not about knowing, it was about doing. So the example that you just gave is like fascinating, right? The idea of literally going into a space like a bar, doing your sexuality or gender in a new way and being like, I didn't know that I could actually be in the space and not be afraid. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know that I could write. So that for her is imagination. She's like the ability of gender and sexual nonconforming people to do their genders and do their sexualities in new ways that were unexpected to commune together in ways they never anticipated. Like lesbians and gay men had not been in common cause as often as they were after gay liberation. They had been before, but not in as with great that much intensity. The fact that they could do those things was really what unleashed the imaginative potential of those movements, not anything that they revealed about the world. And I'm really with her on that. I mean, I told my students yesterday, I'm like, they, they were very into this idea that like, but if people were more educated about AIDS today, then they would do more about it. And I'm like, no, we have a ton of education about it, right? Like, yes, people should know more. Yes, people are very ignorant about HIV AIDS, but the information is out there. 
We yeah. know about racism. We know about yeah. homophobia and we mostly do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. And and for Zerilli, the question is, what makes you want to do something about it? Or even, you know, me being on Discovy with PrEP, mm -hmm. so many in the general public, they have no idea what that is. Sure, but I find that's like, true. But, I, right, isn't that the act, though, of um, blissful ignorance, right? Unfortunately, if it doesn't affect you personally, um, a lot of people tend to Absolutely. turn yes, off the sure. channel. Hey, Ivory Tower Boiler Room listeners and true crime friends. You've heard me gush over this incredible woman and her beautiful products. I'm talking about Mandy Made It. Mandy makes customized and original crochet and cre-cut goods. They are the perfect, unique, one-of-a-kind gift for literally anyone in your life. And she makes incredible home decor. I still have my pumpkins that I put out every fall. I just love them. Check her out on Instagram at M-A-N-D-E-E -E, Made It or search Mandy Made It on Facebook. To order, just slide into her DMs. And if you mention the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, you will receive a free personalized gift with your first order. So... Go on Instagram and look up at Mandy Made It, and Mandy is spelled M-A-N-D-E-E. -E. Again, her handle is at Mandy Made It, Mandy spelled M-A-N-D-E-E, -E, and order today. They're like, yeah. okay, if it, if it, you know hits the boiler plate and I have to deal with it, then that's when I'll actually pick this sure. issue up. Sure. But what I love though, to go into the fun imaginative part mm -hmm. of this discussion is you already brought your idea about shape shifting. Yeah. And I have to discuss also, we're going to get to, I want to have you lay out. So everyone first, just get your book because it's, a claim that I know is going to have a long lasting impact oh, in thank queer you. scholarship. It is because it's the way like you've now made me rethink procreation that it doesn't have to just be identified biologically. Like there is a sure. type of my work I'm kind of getting at um, queer literary um, uh, relationships, like how um, people can pass on information after yeah. their death. And in a way, I'm framing that as procreation. Like well, that's, that's very Valerie Rohe, right? This great yes. queer studies scholar. One of my favorites. Yep. Yeah, thinking about queer reproduction. Yeah, queer kinship, right? Yeah. But um, don't, do you know um, who Octavio Gonzalez is? I know that name for sure, but I don't know that I okay. know their work. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, he has a whole discussion about queer kinship. So, okay. okay. I want to throw that out there. But the fun that you have, though, with your titles, like I yeah, have to get true. to this with you because yeah. you have one that says um, Stepford Wives and Female Men, the Radical Equality of Female Replicants. Then we move to I Cherish My Bile Duct as Much as Any Other Organ, Political Disgust in the dig Digestive Life of AIDS and Tony Kushner's Angels in America. And you even have Beware the hostile yeah. FAG, yeah. Uh, acidic intimacies in the gay male consciousness raising circle and the boys in the band. I just love your life. I love a good title. I always start with a good title before I even write anything. I was going to ask, did the title begin and then your process starts to uh, coalesce around what yeah, you're going to put in the chapter? Yeah, because I think part of it is that I, um, like I said, I really fundamentally believe that popular culture is a form of political theorizing. What I mean by that, again, to reiterate, is the idea that popular culture thinks through um, public life. What does it mean for people to be uh, public together and to commune freely? And of course, popular culture has to think about that because it always has to think about audiences. It is even if you create a form of popular culture that is just about the intimate life of a couple, right? It's ultimately going to be presented to mass audiences. So it becomes public. So the notion of the couple becomes public and then people are going to make meaning of it. So for me, 
when I'm watching movies, like a lot of these movies from the 70s that I write about or this works of literature, like The Stepford Wives, mm-hmm. I'm thinking about the titles because there are certain phrases or statements or moments in those texts that are themselves theoretical concepts, mm. right? Like when Tony Kushner says in a speech, I cherish my bile duct as much as any other organ. I believe if I remember correctly, he gave this as, he said this as part of a graduation speech that he gave at Bard College. I think it's Bard. Um, and what's amazing to me is like, I'm watching Angels in America, this classic, classic play, right? The gay, gay queer, uh, you know, epic play. And it's all about digestive dysfunction. I'm like amazed that so many of the characters have stomach problems and are like shitting their pants and, you know, like cramps and like all of this stuff. And I make this connection in my mind. I'm like, oh, Tony Kushner is really concerned about digestive dysfunction. He even talks about it in his public addresses. Mm. So that phrase, I cherish my bile duct as much as any org- uh, organ, becomes like a theoretical concept for me, right? Like it's it's a description of a way of seeing the world in digestive terms. So that's why I always kind of put titles like first, because they lay out, like a good example, I have an article coming out later this year called Feminism is for Beginners, Learning from Straight Men Doing Queer Feminism. And it's an essay that's all about like the role that straight men have played in theorizing feminist thought, right? Which we never talk about. And They're I'm there. Writing, yeah. And I'm writing about the movie Beginners, which is by, made by a straight man um, that is also a work of autobiography about a really lovely straight man dealing with his father being gay. And um, I love the title because the title is a theory of feminism as a form of beginning. Like, as, as a thing where you're always starting over, right? And it, that's very Zerilli, the idea of inaugural, like that feminism is inaugural. It always, it, it always starts new kinds of relationships. And I wanted to say, what would it look like for contemporary feminism to inaugurate a new relationship to straight men that is not seeing them as enemies to the feminist cause? So that's kind of a long way of saying, like, I think titles are really important because they lead the way for your theoretical work. Yeah, well, yes, I love what you're saying, because I feel that an area of research that really I'm so excited to read your new work. So please send it my way, Ramsey, so I can share it out on social media. Speaking of social media. But um, is that straight men like I'm always curious, too. There's. um. Right now, so much conversation, well, not necessarily academic conversation, but in our social media spheres around men, straight men uh, playing their hyper masculinity up for each other in the gym spaces, in yeah. their fashion. And it's kind of starting to become um, a way of reaffirming their own identity, but it's also really uh, queer male coded. And I think might mark allyship, but might not. And that's why I think there's such an interesting um, discussion to be had, but. I mean, it might also reflect badly on gay men's obsession with hyper-masculinity, you know? I mean, it also, like, it might also reflect badly on the fact that, you know, we're a group of people that desire masculinity, but have an extremely narrow conception often of what mass counts as masculine. You know, mm. I mean, that that would be that would be like the more negative <laughs> reflection. That's it's Leo Bersani, right? Like yeah. that where the, now we're going back to Leo Bersani, who's basically like, you know, when gay men reperform a certain form of hyper masculinity and they think that they're trying to explode it. Most straight men look at that and are like, oh, you're desperate to be just like us. You know, like they don't actually think of it as like exploding gender binaries. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, straight men out there who do listen, you know, definitely reach out to Ramsey or I if you want to start doing this work with us. Right, men we'll might to, like, also want to have sex with men. Yeah, <laughs> and like, don't well, know, I mean, like, they might also want to have sex with men without necessarily being gay, and they don't know how to articulate it. Like, I don't know, it could be any number of things. That's true. I've seen them on Grinder. Okay, yeah. uh, but that's our next. That'll be our edited uh, yeah. book together. Yeah, that's that's gonna yeah. be the book. Put, put, put um, a bit in that. Yeah. Yeah. So men having sex with men on Grinder, Okay. And then drop the mic. But I do like, as we're wrapping up, I really would love because your idea that you just brought up really ties together about current media Uh conversations, especially with bros, which I've lightly touched upon here with other 
And um, I wrote yeah. about it. I wrote uh, the review for the oh, other review books. Yeah, I, I love Okay, so let's movie. talk. So again, mm -hmm. that was done by Judd Apatow, who's a straight uh -huh. man yeah. as a director. So I think that that actually is a good um, ground for your analysis here because all of the um, actual performers were all LGBTQ, yes. mm -hmm. but not the director. So I think yeah. that, do you feel that Having now more out LGBTQ actors, but you said the Boys in the Band in the 70s was groundbreaking in that way. But that conversation hasn't died down about having openly LGBTQ actors. Instead, I feel there's even more pressure that these spaces need to occur. But then there's a type of, I don't want to say backlash, but I'll even say with that new reality show, is it the real... Friends of WeHo or- Oh um, yeah, I barely heard of that, but yeah. Yeah, but there is like judgment from the gay community of are they representing us or not fairly? Nobody's representing anybody. People need to okay, get so over this. Then. Nobody yeah. represents anybody. Human beings are endlessly diverse and heterogeneous. No human being can ever stand in for another person because they're not you. That's it's like literally that's the isolating part of being a of being in this universe is that literally nothing is like you and yet we're all the same and that we're made of stardust. You know, we're made of the same material. The, the, the reason political freedom is all about communion and collectivity is precisely because the incredible alienating atomizing nature of being in this dimension, you know, as a singular unique being that could never ever ever be like anybody else you desperately need connection in order to feel grounded in some way in in the this world that is so plural and diverse that like do i recognize and validate and believe in the value of feeling represented absolutely like it is beautiful to watch something to read a book and to be like i i see myself in this experience you do feel seen i mean i loved bros mm -hmm. because um, the lead character has my affect. But wait, Ramsey is just getting started for his unfiltered thoughts on bros, its LGBTQ plus representation, why he resonates so much with Billy Eichner. So yes, you have to head to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room Cafe. There's another 10 minutes of discussion and Ramsey's just getting started with what he thinks about LGBTQ plus representation in popular TV and film. It is $5 a month, and you not only get Ramsey's bonus episode, you get our whole bonus catalog of episodes. You can watch the video of Ramsey and I and our interview, and you can see all of our videos on the podcast. You get all your true crime and academia bonus episodes. So yeah, $5 a month. Thank you for buying me a coffee. I love my iced coffee. Yeah, I'm a little stereotypical as a gay man, but I love my iced coffee. Don't take it away from me. Thank you all for buying me one. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Okay, see you all there. And thanks again to Ramsey for coming on the show. And get your hands on Queer Forms, his new book. Bye, everyone.